All right, so it's spring and here we are trapped inside. <sighs> oh well. Anyway, so uh, the important announcement is that the exam has been posted. Has anybody taken a look at it? Does it look great and easy? Yeah, I have a question on question 11. <laughs> okay. Let me just say, I will leave us, I'm going to finish up early today and we'll set aside some time and you can ask me questions about the exam. Yeah, I will admit some of the questions are a little bit sneaky. But you can, you can master them, no problem at all. All right, so what we're going to do today is, is finish up this section on chapter 8 and uh, look at translocations and a few other details of that. And then for next week, we're going to start reading chapter 9, which is the chapter on uh, extra chromosomal inheritance. So there's some good stuff in there. Mitochondrial inheritance, paternal inheritance. Oh, it's, it's going to twist you up and turn you all around inside out. It's going to be great. Okay, so what we talked about last time, we talked about a bunch of the properties of chromosomes. We talked about inversions, we talked about dupli duplications, we talked about deletions, and now we're going to talk a little bit about translocations. So here's a little diagram illustrating translocations. So translocations just basically mean you take a chunk of a chromosome and you break it off and you put it somewhere else. So here's an example. We got Here's a, a chromosome A, B, C, D, E, F. Here's one of those VW, X, Y, Z. We snapped off the A, B and we stuck it on this chromosome to produce this result. So that's a reciprocal translocation. We're, we're, or here's a reciprocal translocation, translocation where we actually swap bits and pieces of chromosomes. And uh, then we also get shifts where we just sort of move a piece of a chromosome to somewhere else in another chromosome, not necessarily the ends. Now, translocations can be sneaky because you can get a, have a translocation and if it doesn't disrupt any of the genes, that is, if the breakpoints don't pass through any genes, then you end up with the normal chromosomal complement of genes. And so it has no phenotypic, well, no detectable phenotypic effect most of the time. We'll see a few examples where it does have a phenotypic effect. But in general, yeah, it, it, it doesn't do much. Uh, many of you probably have translocations. They're that common. How do they arise? Well, again, it's, it's that stupid DNA repair machinery. It's very efficient at what it does but it doesn't have any kind of guiding intelligence behind it. So if you get a break like out here, and you've got these enzymes that have stitched together the DNA again, and they see this situation, no, they don't have any way to look ahead and see which chromosome is being attached to which. It's kind of random which piece they're going to attach to which other piece. So you can get things like sometimes it will stitch those two together and then you get a dicentric chromosome and that's going to be lost. I can stitch these two together and then you get an acentric chromosome, that's going to be lost. Or you can have it stitched together the blue chromosome to the orange fragment down here like this and the, orange, the blue fragment to the orange chromosome right there and then you get this rearrangement. Now, as I said, this doesn't have any strong phenotypic effects. It does not mess you up. You've still got, you've still got genes K and D, and usually they're still intact. They're just in a different chromosome. Uh, one effect is this, as we'll see. If you go into meiosis and you're carrying one of these translocations, the chromosomes have to go through all kinds of contortions in order to pair up. So remember, in meiosis, prophase one of meiosis, you want to get those, those homologs all paired up. And uh, the point is, you want to pair up 
A, B, and C with A, B, and C, as you can see there. But if you want to pair up K with K and D with D, you'll make these little cruciform uh, pairings to do that. Now this also has another potential problem. So in meiosis, the cells are pretty good at finding their, their mates and pairing up and forming good structures like this. But then during meiosis, remember we're going to separate these out. What happens if you take this chromosome and this chromosome and put them in the gamete. Well, then what you've got is you've got a duplication of D. So that's a problem. You also propagate the, the uh, translocation. Uh, you're also going to be missing K. So meiosis can lead to problems. Not for the individual, but for their progeny. But you can also get things like if this one separates with this one to the gamete, hey, you're good, no problem. You're back to the normal arrangement. Also though, you can have a balanced translocation where you take this one and this one and put those in the gamete. And then notice what you've got in the gamete is you've got, you've got a K, you've got a D, you've got an A, B, C, and you've got an M, N, O, everything is there. They're just carrying that translocation. So there are ways you can screw up in meiosis, and there's also ways that you can produce perfectly normal, healthy gametes out of the process. And this is just illustrating these contortions there's different ways that the chromosomes can find ways to pair up and line up appropriately. And that's what you're seeing here is just a couple of different diagrams of how, it's, how translocation pairs up. And the end result of this is you can have normal chromosomes, you can have a balanced tra translocation, that is both chromosomes carry the translocation, so these will produce normal offspring. Normal healthy offspring with the right complement of genes. You can also get cases where you've got duplication. So there's duplications of K, and this one's missing D. This one's got a duplication of D, but it's missing K. Uh, so those can cause various problems. Okay, so it's a mixed bag. In some cases, this can propagate serious problems. So this is familial Down syndrome. So Down syndrome, remember I told you, it's just in, caused by non-disjunction of chromosome 21. You got an extra chromosome 21. Uh, it's not in itself heritable. Most forms of Down syndrome, you're not, well, if you're, you're not going to pass them on. Uh, it may not run in families. It's just bad luck that you've had this non-disjunction occur. But in some families, what you find is this, familial Down syndrome, where if you look here, here's an individual who's got chromosome 21, chromosome 21. This is, happens to be latched onto chromosome 14. And if you think about it, this individual is gonna have the normal array of genes. It's got two chromosome 21s and two chromosome 14s, so just that 114 and 121 are linked together. And just like this individual over here, they're going to have no phenotypic effect. Everything's balanced, everything's good. You got the right dosage of everything. However, this individual, when uh, their cells go through meiosis, is going to produce these kinds of gametes over here. So you see one problem right away that you can see is they've got three chromosomes that have to be split up between two cells. So you can guess there's going to be some problems in meiosis here. Uh, the way things can end up is, okay, well, we get, what if a gamete gets this chromosome and this chromosome over here, like that situation? 
That's a normal compliment. It's, it, that's good. Uh, we can also get uh, this situation over here, where it's just this one that gets over to the gamete. In that case, you can see it's got one copy of the genes on chromosome 14 and one copy of the genes on chromosome 21. This will produce a normal child. A normal child who is now a translocation carrier. And in these other cases, well, here we got monosomy that results when they sort out. Uh, there, they've got two chromosome 21s, or chromosome 14s, but only one chromosome 21. That's lethal. Remember, monosomies do not survive, in humans at least. And otherwise, we get the normal, there's a chromosome 21 there, and there's a normal chromosome 21 there, and you're also inheriting this fragment on chromosome 14, so you're functionally, you're functionally trisomic for chromosome 21. So you see how that can get passed on. Another common occurrence is this one. The statistics on this are surprising. One in a thousand babies have this. It's a Robertsonian translocation. And what that means is that you've got two acrocentric chromosomes. That just means the centrosome, the centromere is up near one end of the chromosome. And that's a site that has a greater potential for breakage. So you can have situations where you get two chromosomes that just have this little nubbin hanging off of the centromere on one side. And you get a break there. And then you got these dangling sticky ends of DNA just kind of floating around. And they adhere together and they fuse to make a centric fusion. So you end up with a chromosome here that contains that chromosome and that chromosome. It also loses some little fragments, but if it's an acrocentric chromosome, it's not likely you lose a lot. There's just maybe a few genes there, maybe no genes there at all. So you lose these acentric fragments but now what you've done is you've taken two chromosomes and you've turned them into one. Again, this individual is fine, right? They got, they got both chromosomes represented there, uh, but it can lead to problems when uh, they produce children. Okay, here's, here's a case I want to mention. Uh, this is a case study from, uh, when was this, 2006. You can see the reference down there. It's, it's a fascinating paper because uh, what happened is uh, a woman had a child, a daughter, who experienced some uh, difficulties in school and things like this, otherwise seemed pretty normal, uh, but was kind of slow. They brought her in for genetic testing to see what's going on. And when they looked at her chromosomes, so here's the daughter's chromosomes. This is chromosome six. You see the pair there? You see any problems? There's something missing from this chromosome. Uh, but it, end up, it ended up on chromosome 20. And uh, we can all see that chromosome 11 has a chunk missing, and it's gone over to chromosome 9, and a piece of 9 has gone over to 11. We got all these translocations that occurred in this individual. Furthermore, when they did this study, here's the daughter. The daughter's kind of messed up chromosomally. Again, she was she seemed fairly she was reasonably normal. She had she had problems but was a reasonably functional individual, and she had all these bizarre translocations in her chromosomes. So they said, hey, we, we need to look at mom and examine mom's chromosomes. Here they are. Do you see any difficulties there? Look at that, look at six. So that's where the daughter got it, a broken six from mom. Uh, they also looked at the father. The father seemed to be normal, karyotypically normal. 
Uh, but you can see also little things broken off of chromosome 20 and 11. Oh man, this the mother is also kind of messed up, but she was phenotypically normal and no problems at all. Uh, she reported that, that she had some problems conceiving. So they had to try multiple times to get a child. Uh, but that was kind of the that was kind of the worst of it. And that's pretty common. So these investigators examined in detail all of these chromosomes and figured out what went where, where the broken fragments were attached in various places, and then they modeled it. And it looks like an accident happened. This is a catastrophe, genetically speaking. So you can see here that there are all these little pieces all over the place that are spliced together in just, just higgledy-piggledy in this thing. So the problems look even deeper than they do in that fish uh, photograph in the previous slide. So we've got all these bits and pieces that have been reassembled, repackaged, sort of a Frankenstein's monster of chromosomes. But again, it works mostly. And then they started thinking, hey, you know, what goes on in meiosis in these individuals? Now, you, it, it would not be ethical to operate on mom and open up her ovaries and extract some eggs and ask, you know, physically, what's happening with our chromosomes there? That's just, you can't do that. Uh, but what they can do is model it. And they can say, okay, during meiosis, this piece of this orange chromosome had to somehow pair up with this one. At the same time, a piece of the blue chromosome paired up here. Even though there's so much lately. Anyway, and so we have to get these pieces all spliced together and paired during meiosis. How did they do that? And th this is the nightmare they came up with. That during meiosis, in the mother, they had multiple models, multiple ways of going happen. This is the minimum one, where not everything is lined up perfectly, but most of it is, where you can get them all arranged. And uh, you get these kinds of structures that must have appeared in her eggs when they were going through meiosis. If they were more thorough, if they demanded that everything has to pair up, then you get these things. Look at this, this tangled mess of chromosomes just all over the place, just straining to get lined up. Uh, this, this is a really super game of twister that's going on inside of her cells every time she goes through meiosis. But the amazing thing is it works. Genetics is, is kind of surprising how well it can cope with these bizarre rearrangements of chromosomes. Sometimes it doesn't cope so well. And this is another example of a translocation. Uh, it's called the Philadelphia chromosome. As you can guess, it was first identified at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia because they were karyotyping the kids who came in with like childhood leukemias. So you have these kids coming in who have cancer, you do a routine karyotype, and then everyone sits down and compares the chromosomes of these multiple children. And they found this surprising thing. It kind of surprised them because it happened over and over again in multiple different children. These are independent events that had to have occurred. So what we've got here is chromosome 9 and chromosome 22. Notice that in chromosome 22, it's kind of short and stumpy, whereas chromosome 9 is unusually long over here. Something happened. There was a translocation that had to have occurred and happens, again, repeatedly in different children. There is something about this particular spot in these two chromosomes 
uh, that is prone to chromosome breakage and refusion. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, there's just diagrammed over here. There's chromosome 9, chromosome 22. Uh, there is a gene called C. able on chromosome 9. And this gene is a proto-oncogene. What that means is it's one of those genes that can control cell division. And uh, if it goes nuts, if it gets damaged, it can lead to uncontrolled cell division. And, and that's just bad, right? That's cancer. You don't want that. Over here on uh, chromosome number 22, there is another gene called BCR. Uh, BCR is a reasonably helpful gene. It doesn't do anything terrible. It's, it's reasonably innocuous. It's turned on in lots of cells. So BCR is constitutively active. So all of your cells have BCR turned on. So that, that's what you want. What happens in the Philadelphia chromosome is, for mysterious reasons, it tends to break right at BCR and right at C. able. These two chromosomes do, and they refuse, and they make a fusion protein right over here that unfortunately combines the constitutive activity of BCR with the oncogenic activity of C. able. So if this happens, if you get this fusion, that means it is permanently turning on an oncogene that is then switching the cells into um, division mode. Okay, so this, this is a deleterious effect of a translocation. If you have a translocation that breaks through a particular gene, it can be a source of mutation for that gene. Okay, so this, this happens. Now, how often do these kinds of trends, they happen all the time. There are all kinds of funky things going on in chromosomes. Uh, this is a famous illustration from Science Magazine a number of years ago. I think it was like 30 or 40 years ago. Oh man, I feel old. Where uh, what they did is they just took the chromosomes of humans, H, chimps, C, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to read there. That's uh, G for gorilla and O for orangutan. And they did karyotypes of these. And then they diagrammed the ba banding patterns. And they looked all over the banding patterns and they paired them up, just lined them up. And they could see all these cytological events that had occurred in the history of these organisms. So, for example, here, if we look at human chromosome one and compare it to these other three, one thing that should jump out at you right away is, hey, the centromere is here in humans, it's here in the other primates. How could that be? And then you start looking at the banding patterns around it, and it looks like what happened is there was an inversion of this chunk of the chromosome in humans. So you can see, you know, for instance, these bands here line up with that. This band is up here. So we got a whole uh, chunk of DNA that has been just flipped around. As I told you, that, that does not do serious damage to the genes usually. But it does uh, prevent things that crossing over in that little region. Uh, you can scan around and you can find lots of examples of these things like, oh, like just look at centromeres, for instance. And you can start seeing patterns emerging in how these were centers of various inversions. Here's the exciting one right there. So that's chromosome 2. Humans, remember, have 46 chromosomes. So they have an N of 23, 
chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans have an N of 24. So they've got an extra chromosome or a pair of chromosomes compared to us. How did that happen? Well, you can actually see it when you look here. Look at the banding pattern of chromosome 2 in humans. And compared to the banding pattern right here in this chromosome of chimpanzees. They line up pretty nicely, don't they? And then it also pairs up, this end of it pairs up nicely with this chromosome in chimpanzees. You can do it. Just make it a little longer. Okay, so we got, uh, we got evidence that human chromosome 2 is a composite of two chromosomes from chimpanzees. And we can, we can look in detail at the sequence, we can see that uh, when molecular analyses were made, uh, what they found, for instance, is that right in this region of human chromosome 2, there are the degraded remains of a telomere. Telomeres, you remember from cell biology, they're on the ends of chromosomes. But there's a little fragment of one in the middle of our chromosome 2 which is more evidence that there's a fusion that went on. So all of this is, is telling us about the similarities between humans and other apes, and tells us quite a bit about the changes that occurred in our chromosomes over evolutionary time. The remarkable thing about it is that we're not that much different in chromosome structure from all these other primates. So chimpanzees and humans split oh, about six million years ago. Humans and gorillas, I think it was eight to 10 million years ago. Orangutans split off about 14 million years ago. So in that time, they still retain roughly the same structure of their chromosomes. Now, we can carry out these kinds of analysis in much greater detail. Again, this is old. This is, this is from the 20th century, you know, we're well beyond that. Uh, so this is old stuff where they just kind of looked at, hey, the coarse structure of chromosomes tells us something about the similarities. Uh, now what they've done is you can do a molecular analysis, look at the sequence of these chromosomes. The human genome has been fully sequenced, so has the chimpanzee genome. I think the gorilla and orangutan are in progress. They may have completed them, I haven't looked lately. So yeah, we got much more detailed analyses that we can make. We've also se sequenced things like mice, which creates more opportunities. So what this is, these are papers that have the most colorful diagrams. They're, they're fun to read. Uh, this is an illustration of synteny. So what this is, is it's collinearity or the conservation of blocks of order within two sets of chromosomes that are being compared to one another. So how does this work? Well, over here on the right, that's the human genome, okay? And to keep it simple, what they've just done is they've colored all of the chromosomes. So here's chromosome one, and they made all the dark red. And then they ask, where are the conserved blocks? That is, where you find the same little collection of genes in a neighborhood, in the mouse. So we can look over here. There's, there's the mouse. You can see, okay, there's, there's human chromosome one genes. They're all right in there. We see that there's some more over here and over here. Maybe over here, the color fidelity isn't so great, but no, they, they, it looks like chromosome one has been broken up and splintered and put into multiple places, multiple places in the mouse genome. Keeping in mind that there was a split between mice and humans, what was that, 50 million years ago? Maybe longer. So we've got this split and both species are changing. They're both juggling their chromosomes around. Uh, do not assume that the human arrangement is the ancestral arrangement. It's not. So this is just so we can compare humans with mice. You can pick any other chromosome. Like, oh, let's look at chromosome 12. That's a nice, pretty aquamarine color, I guess. Where is chromosome 12 now? Well, 
in mice, it's kind of scattered among, among a bunch of other canaries. A big chunk of it's still in chromosome 12 of the mouse, but other pieces are elsewhere. So we can work out all the rearrangements that have occurred over evolutionary history. As you might expect, the more remote a species is from us, the more difficult it is to identify centenic blocks. That there's going to you know, have occurred more and more breakup of the arrangement of genes during the period of evolution in question. Here's another one. So here on the left, this is this is all comparing mouse with human. So we're not showing you the mouse or the human outline here. We got this nice little color key over here that tells us. So for instance, human chromosome one is this dark reddish brown. Okay, and we can ask, where did where is human chromosome one's genes? Where are they found? in a mouse and in a chimpanzee. And as you might expect when you look at a chimpanzee, human chromosome one and chimpanzee chromosome one are pretty much in alignment. They've got pretty much the same arrangement of genes. Then you look at a mouse and uh, there's chromosome one from a human, there's chromosome one from the human. It's kind of scattered around in various ways. Uh, I've also seen centenic diagrams uh, illustrating a comparison between fish and humans, and there it just it's just all broken up. It's just little fragments here and there, all spliced together. But this is a tool that lets us look at evolutionary relationships between organisms. Uh, again, they try to cheat here because they just say, okay, well. We know that chimp chromosome two uh, is uh, that human chromosome two is made up of two chimp chromosomes, so we'll actually line them up right here. They even went so far in an extreme act of human centrism. Uh, if you look at chimpanzee chromosomes, they're not numbered one, two, three, four, five, six like ours. They're numbered one, two, two a to bring those together, then three, then four, then five, etc. Okay, so that's it. We're, we're done with the chapter eight for, for now, and I will now turn it over and say, do you have any questions about the exam? And you say you do. For number 11, it talked about the uh, F1 female heterozygous genes and then crossing with the male homozygous genes. And then you asked, what is the arrangement of alleles for the F1 females? Uh-huh. Are you talking about like the arrangement that you, the numbers that you give us, or do we have to figure it out? Let me, let me uh, bring that up here. I'm going to have to, I've got it, I've got my answer key right here, and I want to consult that without, without giving it away, so I'm going to have to turn this off. Actually, I didn't do it right here. Don't be disappointed, it's okay. You, you, you'll figure it all out. Okay. Because I don't remember which one is question 11. Okay, question 11. Oh, wait. Because Canvas renumbers everything for me, read the first part of the question to me, you know. So you're handed an F1 female heterozygous for the genes G, H, and I, yeah. and male homozygous for the recessive okay. traits. I got it. Okay. So um, when I ask for the arrangement of alleles in the F1 females, what I'm asking for is which, which alleles are on one chromosome and which alleles are on the other chromosome. So for example, it could be big G, big H, big I on one chromosome little g, little h, little i on the other chromosome. Is that clear? I think yes, so okay. Female What's that? That's for the female parent then? Yes. Okay. I did not give you the arrangement of alleles, so I just gave you a possible. You've got to figure it out from the cross. Um, and again, remember when we did this before, 
It's the non-crossover phenotypes that tell you what the arrangement of alleles is. So you just have to figure out which of those are non-crossovers. Now, in that particular problem, one of the subtleties that you'll have to think about is that the numbers are all fairly small and fairly close together, right? So what matters is, can you find complementary pairs? You see what I'm saying? So big G, big H, big I would complement little g, little h, little i. And you have to figure out what the pair of them, which, which group that pair is. Are they non-crossover, double crossover, or the single crossovers? Do you just ask for like the arrangement of the female? How do you know which one? How do you know which one's the female, which one's the male? Oh, in that in this particular problem, I tell you, I give you a male homozygous for the recessive traits. So the male F1 is just little g, little h, little i on both chromosomes. More questions? Let's see if I can make any suggestions here. Um, so the question about leopard and zebrafish, that's going to be an epigenetics question. Okay, think about you got, you got a mutation that causes the normal stripes to be spots. And you got a mutation that causes the stripes to go away. What is the phenotype if you combine those two? It's not stripes and it's not spots. You'll figure that out. Uh, oh, uh, the problem about star eyes and curly wings. I just want to mention that one of the things you have to realize is this is not a test cross. You know, in most of the cases I've given you, it's been a test cross where you cross to a homozygous recessive individual. Uh, in this case, you're crossing two heterozygotes. So it's not going to be as clean a result. You're going to have to figure out the frequency of the types of gametes that are produced. And then the probability of this gamete and this gamete coming together, and this gamete and this gamete, uh, that'll give you the, the numbers you need. Okay. I hope the rest are fairly straightforward. That's my question. On the on 21 with the exotic leaf hopper. Uh huh. Um, when you say the true breeding, the true breeding like female, how do you know like which seed is because you don't like <laughs> Oh well, I tell you she's true breeding, mm -hmm. and I tell you the phenotype. And if they're true breeding, they have to be homozygous. Because then for the male, you only give one trait, so... Oh, and if I give you just one trait, assume the other ones are the wild type. <laughs> so we're dealing with three traits here. I tell you, here, this one, I just single this one out and say this is the mutant. Assume the other two are wild type. So what's like considered wild type? Uh, in this case, uh, that would be the dominant traits. Okay. Yeah, so I just mentioned here, the assume we're not specified, the animals are carrying a dominant wild type of real. Okay, and uh, the unique thing about that problem is when you look at it, uh, the distribution of the males, the distribution of the females is so different because it's an excellent trait. And uh, you have to think about which of those sexes matters in carrying out your calculations. So that's just another little twist on the familiar problem. Any more? 
Now you need to go home and shovel out your driveways or something? Yes? Just a general clarifying question. Um, is the final part of the test that can be dropped at the end of the semester? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we just don't have to take it. Yeah. That's right. So if you do well in all the exams and get to the final, you can just say, screw it, I don't want to do it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Is exam four of the final the same thing? Or is there a uh, exam Oh man, you're asking me to remember all these things. I think we do have four exams in class and then a final. So five total. I think it's that the last one is the second of the last week or something like that. So it'll be coming up soon. All right, so get to work on those exams. If you have more prop, more questions, uh, the lab this week is kind of light, so if you want to stop by the lab on Thursday, which is from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock, I'll be there. Yep. Yeah.